Three other Cox theoretic properties of a tau cohomology with multi coefficients and a cohomology of two more varieties, part one. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and to the organizers for the invitation to speak here. Uh, so everything I'm talking about is a uh, joint with Toby G, who uh, who will be giving the second talk in this series after lunch. So, so, so the context for this talk is. It's in the goal of the, the work of a, a lot of people in recent years, which is to try and understand cohomology of Shimura varieties with FP or ZP coefficients. And I, I think an, a kind of overarching philosophy premised on you know, optimism and necessity for other arguments is that there'll be a dichotomy. We saw one half in the previous talk which is when you look at cohomology of uh, arithmetic quotients that are not Shimura varieties, they will be rife with torsion. And the torsion will probably be the most interesting part. On the other hand, the kind of other uh, side of the dichotomy is that in the case of Shimura varieties, one hopes that there will be little torsion. And that the uh, sort of the, the torsion free part of the cohomology will dominate the situation. And, and so there's sort of then an even you know, a further optimism that if, you know, one could hope to, uh, one could hope to kind of, if one knew such things, one could hope to use torsion freeness in Shimura variety contexts to, uh, to understand torsion in non-Shimura variety contexts. And so that's, uh, that particular statement is not something that will be at all investigated on or elaborated on in this talk, but it's, it's, but it's a motivation for, for what one is thinking about. And so a problem, basic problem is how do you study cohomology with FP or ZP coefficients. And uh, well, sort of how do you study cohomology? Well, I guess in the context of Shimura varieties, the basic tool that people have used with success is Hodge theory. Uh, maybe in its most extreme form in uh, Franke's weighted L2 paper, where he explains all cohomology of everything in, in Kajic zero in terms of automorphic forms. And so a, now a kind of a, that suggests what you should do for, say, FP coefficients is you should use Durand methods in characteristic P. And people have certainly done this with, with uh, great success. But there seem to be limitations, partly because once you have P in the level, varieties get bad reduction. And so Durand methods become harder. And to get any kind of control in the reduction, one has to often make very ramified base changes. And then things get harder still. And finally, the, the most powerful tool you have in these Durand methods is piatic Hodge theory, which links you back to Atel cohomology, which is sort of the, the source of the Galois representations. And so that's maybe the source of interest for number theorists. So sort of your Durand side is, the so is a place where you can compute and connect the automorphic forms. The Atel side is what you want to understand. And piatic hodge theory links the two. But if you're looking at ZP or FP coefficients, piatic hodge theory also becomes very delicate. So, uh, so if you ha one has good deduction, then one has results of Fontana messing and faultings relating some cohomology over, say, an unramified extension of QP to, uh, with FP coefficients to some Durham cohomology of the good deduction variety. And if you have bad reduction, say semi-stable reduction, there's a comparison theorem more recently of, uh, of Caruso, generalizing or building on your work of Hyodo and Kato and Suji and others, where he can uh, compare log crystalline cohomology to Atoll cohomology. But again, there are restrictions on dimensions that you can consider and on uh, the amount of ramification. He can always, he can, in his result, one can never break the bound that E is less than P minus one. And so, so the goal of today's talk is to sort of explain you know, some sort of fairly modest attempt to do something when E is greater than P minus 1, or, or at least equal, rather, to P minus 1, as it turns out. But, but that won't play any role. Somehow, E greater than or equal to P minus 1 is the point. P minus 1 will, will play not so much of a role. So, 
Um, so, so let me state a theorem. So, in, so, I, so in this theorem, some Shimura variety is going to appear, but but I'll ask you in advance not to press me too hard to talk about the details of the Shimura variety and the moduli problem. They're not so relevant. This is a method is somehow geometric and then Piatti Hodge theoretic. The Shimura variety does you know the Shimura variety I'm choosing is a one that our methods sort of suit, but the kind of Shimo, uh, this variety, qua Shimura variety, is not going to be kind of the key focus. So, so I'm going to be a little um, in, in glib in the details. So I'll just say that x is a g u m minus 1 Shimura variety. Defined over E, where this E is quadratic imaginary. And, uh, and I want to assume it's associated to a division algebra D over E with some appropriate involution and so on. And so, so this assumption is just going to put us in a situation where the uh, the way the geometry of the bad fiber we end up looking at is going to be uh, a sort of height one, height one uh, formal modules. So it's sort of putting us in the Dreamfeld case. So the Dreamfeld context. And we, uh, so we let P So let P be a prime splitting in E and, uh, and at which D splits. So our, our GUM minus 1 locally at P. So, uh, so this is uh, sort of over QP is going to look like GLN QP for the unitary group, and then I guess some copy of QP star for the multiplier. And uh, I need to talk about a Hecker algebra. So, so T so it'll, so T will just be a kind of polynomial ring over ZP whose variables are the Hecker operators. At primes split in E and split for D. So, so then here's the theorem. Ah, but but what I should say is that uh, I should say one other thing here with X. So it's this thing. So I want just to avoid. Uh, Complications, some slight complications. I want to assume the level is neat, just so that the uh, the x the uh, the symmetric space mod gamma, the gamma is torsion free. But but other so it's neat, but otherwise arbitrary level. So in particular, there could be any power of p in the level, and that's part of the point. Uh, yes. So a, a prime split in and prime to p and and whatever else is in the level and then the theorem is that let m be a maximal ideal in this hecker algebra and well there we have some variants of the theorem but i'm going to state just one variant so in this variant I'm going to assume that there exists an irreducible continuous Galois representation from GE to GLN of uh, P bar. Perhaps, yeah, let me put ZP bar here. Let me every way just have gone to FP bar and ZP bar just to make life easier. So then. 
Well, see, we're going to have any power of p in the level, so then essentially all weights can be trivial. So it will always be trivial weight. But once you can have any power of p in the level, that doesn't really matter. So, so, uh, so we assume we have this uh, Gower representation attached to m in the usual way. Well, certainly one can one can find such m's because we can just uh, take characteristic zero automorphic forms for which many people in the audience here know how to construct Gower representations and then produce m's. And so we take, so we assume this Gower representation exists and we want to assume some properties. So, oops. So there'll be some sort of auxiliary assumptions about the image of this row m. So one will be that uh, p is greater than or equal to, to n, where this is our, our n, always the same n here. So p is greater than or equal to n, and there's some finite subfield of fp bar so that sln k is contained in the image of this row m, and which is contained in uh, fp bar star times g ln k. So that's some kind of very big image assumption. Oh, another assumption, one prime, is that rho, rho happens to be an induction where, uh, where psi is some character and uh, with E prime over E of uh, degree N. So, of course, it, I mean, if I'm assuming always this row M is continuous, so implicitly that puts some restrictions on this psi. So those, so those are some, some image assumptions. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, so then, so those are kind of some, the role of those assumptions is auxiliary. The role of those assumptions is that later when you're working in cohomology localized at M and you find a Gower representation in your reducible constituent, you'd like to know that it's equal to this row M. And when the dimensions are bigger than two, that's less easy than it was when the dimension is two. And so you need some assumptions for it. And so that's, so the job of this one and one prime is to, to recognize later that certain Gower representations appearing in cohomology are actually this row M. And then, the, but the next assumptions are, are kind of the important ones. So, so rho M locally at P. Ah, so here, so here I should choose I, I choose one for all a place above P. So that the so E V is kind of QP and I'll just write QP. It's a, it's a psychological my psychological benefit. So um so this row M locally at QP should be R regular for some R less than or equal to M minus one on two. And so our regular a kind of a genericity hypothesis, which I'm not going to explain anymore in this talk, but it's, it'll be uh, a big topic in Toby's talk. But it's a genericity hypothesis. It's essentially somehow that the inertial weights of it should be sufficiently distinct. And then assumption three is that P should be large enough. So in fact, this P, I mean, P going to the end sort of gets killed anyway, swamped by this. And, uh, and finally, if, if R equals M minus one over two, which is sort of the upper range on what we allow, then rho M locally at P contains 
an irreducible subquotient of dimension greater than one. So in the in the in the kind of boundary, the extreme boundary case of what we can handle. So we'll see in a moment this R is kind of actually secretly a degree of cohomology. So in the highest degree of cohomology we can handle, we need this auxiliary assumption. Okay, so those are all the assumptions. Uh, uh, so, yes. So then uh, HI, then HI uh, X with coefficients in ZP localized at M uh, equals zero for I less than or equal to R and it's torsion free for i equals r plus 1. So that's the theorem. So, so in some sense, the best case is when n equals 3, so n minus 1 over 2 is n equal to 1, and we are in, uh, in this case, because then this is really saying that the cohomology will vanish below the middle, and it'll be torsion free in the middle. So it will be for, Picard, for certain Picard modular surfaces. So, okay, so that's the, uh, that's the theorem we, we're trying to prove. And um, so how do, we, how do we prove this theorem? Well, 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 let me sort of talk about just slightly about the history of such results, which gives me a chance to also mention some, uh, some previous names. So, oh yes. When you write the AP algebra, actually it doesn't seem to make any difference given your final statement, but do, do you think of P as the final dimensional algebra acting on, for example, the topology in wave zero, or do yeah. you think really of the enormous? Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the first thing. In the end, the first thing. The first thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, it's the enormous thing, but then it's acting on this HI, so then it factors through the first thing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but I mean, so sort of the only reason I made a remark about having to assume this row M exists is just that, I mean, a priori, this could have torsion. And then we could have happened to choose an M where this localization was purely torsion. And then that would be an M about which, you know, which sort of doesn't lift to characteristic zero in a priori. And then that would be a case where theorems wouldn't apply. So sort of, so somehow, so we're kind of, so in this theorem, there's sort of, we're in a situation where if we're assuming sort of if there were torsion, it would at least be, con I mean, the, in practice, the way you would make this, I mean, in practice, the way you make this row M, as I said, will be from something in characteristic zero. So this is sort of will be, allow you to rule out kind of torsion that's congruent to, uh, to characteristic zero eigenforms. Right? That sort of, yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, sort of, yeah, I mean, they probably shouldn't exist. That's, so yeah, so the most kind of, so the most optimistic expectation of which this will fall far short, will be that some analog of Arthur's conjecture were true for FP cohomology, and then in particular you might hope that any irreducible row bar only contributes to the middle. No, I mean it's, it's a it's a genericity condition on the uh, so you look at the inertial weights and they should have. Gap. I mean, somehow there's n inertial weights, and they should be sufficiently spread apart. And they like roughly, but Toby will kind of tell you precisely what it means next time. No, basically, somehow, if you uh, so the the gap, if you give yourself more gaps, then you can kill more cohomology. Yeah. But for example, some, for example, if, if you uh, so the I mean, the argument is going to be purely local essentially. And so, for example, suppose rho was trivial plus cyclotomic, which, I mean, which is sort of ruled out by that irreducibility, but that's not really relevant. Local, I mean, locally we could in principle entertain that, but trivial plus cyclotomic appears in H0 of a modular curve. So you're not going to kill H0 of a modular curve localized at trivial plus cyclotomic, but you can hope to kill it at trivial plus cyclotomic squared if P is you know, bigger than uh, 3. So, so 
So, um, so that's the kind of point of this Aria Aguila. This Aria Aguila kind of forces the inertial weights to be uh, separate enough to sort of at least you know, naively give you a hope to kill off the lower degree cohomology. So, so sort of previous results So, uh, well, the, the one that I think should be most mentioned, I think, is uh, due to Kai Wan Lan, and I hope I have the spelling correct, and Sa, who uh, proved uh, sort of vanishing away from the middle degree and sort of torsion free. middle degree in many, maybe all, all PEL contexts, but for x of good reduction and weights may be often deep in the fontaine fire range. So as I said, if, once we have a vanishing result with constant coefficients, but for any level, with, this is secretly a vanishing result for all weights, because just by Shapiro's lemma, the, uh, you know, the cohomology at level, full level p is the same as cohomology at level prime to p with coefficients in, in a group ring which has every weight in it. And so, so, uh, so this is giving vanishing for sort of all weights with no, no restriction on the range, for example. So, so that sort of, so it's suddenly much weaker than than the results in terms of the generality and the degree, but it's stronger in terms of the uh, the kind of weights and the reduction. And and then some other relevant work to mention is that uh, Tilloween and then Mladen Dimitrov uh, used. Uh, They bootstrapped to, uh, to kind of arbitrary uh, weight. Oh, sorry, to arbitrary level. In the ordinary case, so by you, by looking in some contexts, so by by beginning, so they they had special cases of of these results. I mean, this is chronologically before this, but they had special cases of these results. So, and then by using kind of a theory of, uh, here the theory of ordinary cohomology, if you've kind of proved a vanishing in uh, level prime to p, you can hope to bootstrap that to kind of vanishing of ordinary cohomology in, in higher levels. And, and they did that. So, so our argument is going, thank you. And so, so our method is certainly going to have a, have a bootstrap aspect to it. And so, 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 so bootstrapping essentially means that if you prove things at level gamma 1p, that's enough. That's sort of the general principle that in mod p modular forms, everything happens at level gamma, all weights sort of already happen at level gamma 1p. So somehow, so in the, in the sort of next parts of the talk, in the geometric parts of the talk, I'll be focusing on levels gamma naught and gamma 1p. Yeah, th I mean they. Well, the thing is, this is worse because we somehow don't get as high as. I mean, they get. I mean, we would like to get all the way to the middle, but we can only get part way. So um. So. So 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 this bootstrapping aspect will be in in our argument as well, but it, but there'll be no kind of ordin ordinary assumption. And in some sense, the main thing to get around is, uh, is this difficulty with the fontaine lafay range. So, okay. So, so how do you, how do we prove such a result? So, so here's the idea. So here's sort of the naive idea 
the naive idea would be the following. Well, so, so first of all, it's enough <coughs> to prove that hi x fp by m equals 0 for i less than or equal to r plus 1. then that will certainly kill off the ZP cohomology in those degrees and it will give you the torsion freeness in the next degree along. And so, so in the arguments we'll focus on FP bar cohomology. And so the naive idea is, <coughs> suppose that HI, oh uh, sorry, thank you. So suppose that HI X ZP bar is torsion free for a moment. Suppose we, and of course that's sort of somehow what we're trying to prove, but suppose we knew it, then, then we would have the following situation. So let me just say for all i, since it's just a fantasy anyway. So then we will be in the situation where we would have the ZP bar cohomology mapping on to the FP bar cohomology. And this will be sitting inside the QP bar cohomology. And this, the Piatti Codd theoretic structure of this is known thanks to our characteristic zero Piatti Codd theory. So characteristic zero Piatti Codd theory is extremely robust. So this has, so this has a, a lot of adjectives attached to it. It's potentially semi-stable. Uh, one sort of has, a, if in the Shimura variety context, one can hope to understand exactly over what field it becomes semi-stable. And when you, and then there's some descent data. There's some, uh, there's some in, in, on the on the Dodone module. There's some inertia group action measuring that ramification you had to introduce to get semi-stable reduction. And one can hope to know precisely what that descent data is in terms of the Shmuel variety. And so one can essentially imagine you, this. You know everything about. This is some essentially unknown lattice inside here, and this is a reduction of that lattice. So the other, but then in recent years. There's been a lot of development in the study of reductions of lattices in potentially semi-stable representations. So the theory of what are called Broy modules, sort of extending fontaine lafay theories, been massively developed. And so, and so one has kind of essentially there, you know, knowing some Fontaine-style adjectives here, you can deduce some Fontaine-style adjectives here, which you can then hope to use to make an argument. So with those adjectives, you then have this assumption on our regularity, and then you make an argument and show that this row M, if, if, if it's R regular and this R is big enough, and here the hodge tate weights are bounded by from zero to I, if the R is sort of big enough, then you get some incompatibility. So, so there's sort of two steps. There's sort of the step of realizing this cohomology as the reduction of a lattice in a, in a known potentially semi-stable representation. Having done that, there's a kind of piatti kodge theory step which uses the actual hypothesis on row M. So in the rest of this talk, I just want to discuss the naive idea and how to, fix, how to make it actually work. So, so the hypothesis on the row and the M and everything else will be irrelevant from now on. So the basic difficulty with this approach is that this may not be torsion-free and it just may not work. So that's sort of the difficulty. And so what you need to do is, but, but what you realize is that in, in the kind of arguments we want to make, which is very common in this sort of ramified, in this ramified integral piatti kodge theory, a Broy module is a pretty complicated object. And there's often, yeah, so in, in, an, so in an ideal world, you'd have a precise comparison theorem relating this Atel cohomology to the Broy module, telling you everything about the Broy module from this or vice versa. But these Broy modules are extremely complicated. When you make arguments to show they could or couldn't exist in a certain context, you don't use the precise details normally. You use some other kind of robust and coarse information. And in particular, to prove the theorem, all one needs to know is that this has Hodge state weights 0 to i, and it has a given and the descent data, the inertial action, belong, is a, comes from a given finite set of characters. That's all you need to know. And so one could hope to take this cohomology and realize it as a reduction of a lattice in something with those properties, but which is not this, but just some other thing that does the job. 
So the idea sort of sort of so non-naive idea if you like. The modification is that we take our our let me write row inside H I X F P bar and we find some potentially semi-stable V. With a, with a, well, first of all, with Hodge Tate weights in the interval 0 to i, with, a, with known descent data, and with with an invariant lattice L such that rho bar is contained in L mod in the reduction. So, so yeah, let me just give a slightly convoluted answer because we're going to have to ultimately, I mean, I. Let's say to begin with locally, except that locally we certainly want to allow it to be reducible. And so, and we're going to find this V by chopping X up in various ways. And then if V is reducible, it can't be split when you chop up X. But if it's, if it's irreducible, if it's reducible, it could. So in fact, for a moment, you have to remember that it was globally irreducible as you make these choppings. And the moment you've done that, you kind of forget that. So the way I'm going to explain the argument is I'm going to do everything locally. And then at some point, I'm just going to remark that, ah, the kind of devisage we did could clearly have been achieved globally. So. They had two answers. Um, so, uh, so how do we find this V? So I th although there's um, so so in the end there's a certain construction we make, but I think it's again at least for me psychologically easier to kind of basically repeat this construction construction three times in a kind of progression of of steps. So I want to begin by explaining how you would handle H one. H naught we know is always torsion free, so H naught is kind of handled by the naive idea. So how would you handle H one? And I'm going to talk about that. But, but the most complicated thing in some sense to handle is the descent data. So I'm going to also ignore the descent data at first. And in the third iteration, we'll come back to the descent data. So kind of, uh, so, so let me begin by explaining how would you ever do this if you, if you had this row in H1. So let's suppose x is semi-stable. So we have x over qp is semi-stable at p. And I want to uh, understand it's h1. So, and, and for me, this x will always be uh, smooth and projective. And so I say that because of what I'm about to do. So what I can do is I can, uh, I can choose a hyperplane section y in x again with semi-stable reduction because perhaps you know, the reduction of x might <coughs> look like this. And I just, if I choose a, hyper, a generic hyperplane section, it will, will cut, it will cut that, those planes transversely. And you'll get cut it in two lines crossing. So you'll have two planes crossing. You take a generic hyperplane section, you'll get two lines crossing. So a generic hyperplane section will again be uh, semi-stable. And by weak left sets, the H1 X embeds into the H1 Y. And so we reduce the problem of lower dimension. And we induct until this Y becomes a curve. 
with semi-stable reduction, and curves have torsion-free cohomology. And so then the naive idea works. So, so by induction, we reduce to y a curve where the naive idea works. So that's, so that's how one would handle the case of H1. So that, in fact, that will already sort of give you the theorem for, for U21. So with that, and well, I haven't explained the descent data step, but essentially, the, uh, in the U21 case, what's going to happen is you're going to have this, you're going to have this row bar in the cohomology of U21, and you want to understand its properties, and you're going to cut this Picard surface with just some crazy hyperplane section that's get some completely random non shimura variety curve. But that curve is sort of going to be the thing that controls your Gawa representation. Okay. So, so the question part of now is to try and generalize this for higher degree uh, cohomology. So that will be the second iteration of the method. So this was sort of the first iteration was just to handle weak H1. So the next iteration is to handle arbitrary cohomology, degree, arbitrary degrees, but, but to still assume that I'm in the semi-stable case. And so, so the method, I'd, so I don't know its provenance exactly, but it's certainly a very special case, I think, of what Balenson uses in his so-called basic lemma. And I learned it from Nari's approach to motors where he also uses Balenson's basic lemma, but explains it in a, and that's a very transparent geometric way. So, so that's the, so the idea comes from so Balenson basic lemma. But it's just a, it's a judicious applica application of weak left shifts. So, so the problem is that we don't quite know a standard class of projective varieties with torsion free cohomology in degrees bigger than one, unlike we do for curves. So we have to cook cook things up slightly more. And so we have the following statement. If x is smooth and projective, and y and z are generic hyperplane sections, then when we look at the cohomology of x minus y, relative to z minus y, so this is of dimension n, then this cohomology is concentrated in degree n, and that for any coefficients, for fp or z, or qp or zb coefficients, and therefore is torsion free. And so that's, uh, so that's the kind of statement that we need to use. And, uh, so if you want to see how, I mean, so this just follows immediately from weak left jets. If you want to see it I mean, in real time, one way to think about it is that it's kind of clear that you're going to get vanishing below n just immediately by applying weak left jets. But then this situation is Poincaré dual with what you get by switching y and z, which is the same situation, and hence you get vanishing above degree n as well. So you get, so all the cohomology lives in the middle. So these are sort of some basic pairs of affine varieties which have torsion-free cohomology which you can try and use to build the cohomology of any other variety. And that's what we'll do. So, so you just do it. So what we see is, so we now suppose x is semi-stable over qp and we, uh, we, just, we look at just a whole bunch of exact sequences. So we can look at the cohomology of x, and that restricts to the cohomology of x minus y. And we have the cohomology, the local cohomology along y. And, I'm as, and everything is smooth, so um, x and y is projective. So this is isomorphic to the cohomology degree 2 minus less of y with a Tate twist. And so if we, have our, if we have our row, if we have our row here and it's irreducible, it's either here 
or here. And here we've reduced to dimension one less. There's a twist which adds a Hodge weight, but there's minus two which gets rid of a Hodge Tate weight, so everything is okay. And the inductive hypothesis applies. And so then we should think about this case. And for that, we should just make another exact sequence. So we look at the exact sequence of the, of the pair. So we have the cohomology of x minus y relative to z minus y. And that restricts to the cohomology of x minus y. And that restricts to the cohomology of uh, z minus y. And well, z minus y, we can kind of handle just by the analogy with handling x minus y. It's again, this is a smooth projective variety of dimension one less, and we're removing a hyperplane section from that. So there we, if our row, so our row bar was either here, we're done, or else it's here. And if it's here, it's either here or here. If it's here, we're done again by an induction. And if it's here, now the basic lemma applies, and it's in something torsion free, so the naive idea works. So here, the na naive idea works. So, uh, so that's um, so. So one thing I should say is that, of course, one needs to know that all the cohomology in sight is potentially semi-stable, and is uh, has Hodge Tate weights that every time I put an I, the Hodge Tate weights are between zero and I. But the so the potential well the potential semi-stability is uh, in in this generality is proved by Kisson. And so you know potential semi-stability. But then in the, in the, if our x has semi-stable reduction, every time we see a proper variety appearing, we actually know that, we have semi, that we're not only potentially semi-stable, but semi-stable. And then to check, whether, to check whether extensions of, if you have something potentially semi-stable that's an extension of semi-stable things, it's again semi-stable because the descent data is the action of a finite group and hence compatible with forming extensions. So, so in fact, in our case, everything in sight will be uh, really semi-stable. And then to check the Hodge-Tate weights, well, then we can compare with Durham cohomology where we know Hodge filtrations and you just check. Or, or probably people here who are more geometric than me will know straight away that the Hodge-Tate weights are fine, but if you don't, it's very easy to check. So, so that's sort of the idea of the argument. And uh, the, um, and then we sort of, you need to, have essentially one more idea to keep track of descent data. You need one more kind of step to keep track of descent data. Because what will happen, for example, what will the x be in our case? So the x would be a, an x1p, or it would be a Shimura variety of kind of level gamma 1p. And it will, it will be defined, well, globally it's defined over E, so in, locally at P it's defined over QP. But it won't be semi-stable over QP. You have to uh, join P roots of unity to get semi-stable reduction. And in the piatti koch theory arguments, it's vital to know that the, uh, the, that the rho bar is not just the reduction of something semi-stable over QZ to P, but that it's a reduction of something semi-stable over which descends which descends in a non-semi-stable way back down to QP with some very specific prescribed descent data. So you have to be able to handle the descent data. And so what you need to do is uh, just figure out a way to kind of put descent data into this act into this kind of framework. So And one thing we need to remember is that these, as soon as we start taking these hyperplane sections, if X is a Shimura variety, these are not going to be. In, in fact, I shouldn't even call them hyperplane sections because, because, uh, because we, want, we don't want, the, we want the, row, the row to really live in always here one piece or the other. And so, so we need to work, uh, this is a moment when we need to really work globally because you don't want to assume that the row is locally irreducible. But globally, it's irreducible. So we need to sort of work globally. And, uh, and we don't want to make a, a finite, we don't want to make an unnumified base change, because that could again kill the irreducibility hypothesis. So we, in fact, have to use Bjorn Poonen's 
quite a version of uh, Bertini. Because we have to make these hyperplane sections to be generic, but without extending the, the residue field. And so we have to really take sufficiently high degree hypersurfaces. So these are some sort of incredibly, these X's, and if X is a Shumov variety, these Y's and Z's are some very high degree hypersurface sections. They're not Shumov varieties anymore. So, so they don't have any reciprocity, they don't have you know, any kind of re, you know, reciprocity laws governing them in, as such. Indeed they might, but we don't. In fact, we're going we're gonna to give them some, but we're going to give them, that's the weakest part of a reciprocity law that we, we need and can establish. And so let me explain it. So, so the, the sort of idea is that you know, this is a, a kind of motivic argument. So what we can move around are motivic concepts. So we, we can certainly hope to move around concepts, uh, correspondences, in particular group actions. So, for example, if our X had a group action, we could apply this to X mod G first. We could choose our, we could kind of look at X mod G, choose Y and Z generically in X mod G, then look at the pre-images in X, and we could choose the Y and Z to be equivariant with, this, with the G action. So we could hope to do a kind of equivariant version of all this, if you had, say, a finite group action Finite group G acting on X, and then so then the idea is that you uh, you want to encode, you want to say that on the special fiber, you want to find models on the special fiber where the G metric inertia action on the special fiber after you make the ramified base change is factoring through some physical group action. And now you can hope to move that physical group action through this hyperplane section argument. So that's the idea. So you somehow need to make the, the descent data more physical. You have to really make it a concrete geometric inertia action that has a concrete motivic kind of description. And then you can move it around. So, so what I'll do is I'll explain, rather than stating a kind of general theorem, I'll just explain the actual setup in the Shimur variety case because that illustrates everything. So, so what, what, what does our Shimura variety look like? So, so, our, so we return to our Shimura variety. And to be more precise, just slightly more precise, we consider two Shimura varieties. So x1p and x0p. So, so there's always could be some auxiliary level structure away from p, which is completely irrelevant. Here, of course, p, is, p stands for the, the choice of p above p in E, but I'll just write p. And this here, I mean the Wahori level structure. And here, I mean appropriate Iwahori. Remember that the level structure has to sit inside GLN QP cross QP star. So with the multiplier is sort of harmless, we have ZP star, we take pro P Iwahori inside GLN QP. So that's the, uh, those are the level structures we look at. And then these, these uh, have described moduli problems. So which conveniently were, were described for me in Anna's talk yesterday morning. So, so X not P, in the end this sum, um, chain of uh, a finite fact of uh, groups there's some chain of p isogenies and an x1p I will describe the moduli problem in a minute because it's most convenient to describe the moduli problem for uh, X for x not p, for, uh, sorry, it's most convenient to describe the moduli problem for x1p in terms of a certain diagram that I'm about to draw. So, so we have x not p, and we have this map, and I learned this description from an, a paper of, uh, of Haynes and Rappaport, that there's this map to a product of octate stacks which just sends a chain that sends this chain C. 
So what is the ORT Tate stack? That's a stack over ZP that classifies finite flat group schemes of order P. I'll write down an equation for it in just a moment. But before I write down the equation for it, let me describe this map. I just go to the kernel of, uh, so these are P isogenies, maybe alpha naught up to alpha M minus one. I go to the kernel of alpha I minus one. Yeah. So this is mapping to ORT Tate plus ORT Tate, and this chain C goes to a tuple, which is a kernel of the alpha I minus 1 for I equals 1 to N. And now, each, this ORT Tate stack has a, has a group scheme over it, the universal group scheme, which has a generating scheme. So, so I'll write G cross. So G will be the universal group scheme over the ORT Tate stack, and G cross is the complement of the zero section. So that's the kind of universal uh, space of generators. I guess this n factor is just one map. So we have uh, this, and then x1p is defined to be this fiber product. And that, in fact, gives us a model for, so this, so this chain description is a model for x0p over, over zp. And so this fiber product gives us a model for x1p over zp, but which is not the best model in the world. It's not semi-stable. It's certainly not the worst model in the world either, because it won't, it's not hard to make it semi-stable. So, uh, So, so what does ORT Tate look like? It's a very simple and beautiful thing. You just have uh, two variables. And the product has to just be equal to some number. And this is some number computed in the paper of ORT Tate. It's in, ZP, it's in P times ZP cross. So it's some uniformizer for ZP, which is an explicit uh, computation in ORT Tate. So what ORT Tate do is they tell you how if you give yourself two elements in a, a kind of ZP algebra whose product is this number, you write down a finite group scheme of order P. And of course, there's some ambiguity. So you have to kind of quotient out by GM and, and take a stack. And so the, so the GM action is that uh, lambda on XY goes to lambda to the p minus 1x, lambda to the 1 minus p y. So, uh, and, ha and then how does this map look? So, so let me describe this map, which is easiest to write down, in the neighborhood of, a, the, of the most super singular points. So this x naught p is semi-stable. As Anna explained, so in Anna's talk, she had a kind of product of two of these x0ps. But if you just cut her talk in half, you're left with, uh, with one of them, uh, sort of vertically down the blackboard. You cut it in half. You're left with one of these. And then you, you get this, uh, in particular, around a super singular point. So, so you have uh, this x0p around a super singular point. So sort of a formal completion around a super singular point looks like uh, z. Uh, and some, let me say some, uh, put a bar over this. It's a geometric, a geometric uh, super singular point. Looks like sort of ZP bar, a numified hat, a join n variables and parameter, and not, rather not a t, just n variables, such that the product is equal to p. But let me just change the variables so that the product's equal to w. I mean, I can just scale this xn by some unit for this to be true. And then the map, so then the map from, uh, so, then the, so then this maps to this product of all tates just by sending uh, a point here to x1. And then here I take the product, I, I omit x1 from the product. Here I have x2, I emit x2 from the product, 
in, in general, I have uh, xi, and then I emit xi from the product. So, so that's the map. And essentially, th these coordinates are these coordinates are sort of the the action of this isogeny on on the Lie algebra, and, and you can sort of choose it or take parameters to be the same. So. Uh, so now, how does how does x one p look? So 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 the g g star has an exceptionally simple description as well. To um, we just add a variable z, which is a p minus first root of x, the first octate coordinate. That's that's how you choose a, a generator of one of these octate finite flat group schemes. Of course, you quotient out by gm. So gm acts on z just by lambda, and then you can see where this p minus one came from up there. And so, well, so now we can just compute. We can compute the. Uh, we can compute the product so we can look at so x1p kind of completed, sitting over x naught p completed, mapping to this product of octates. And here's this product of uh, g stars. So what does this look like? It looks like uh, the piano if I'd had. We just have. Uh, Z1 up to Zn with the equation Z1 through to Zn multiplied to the P minus 1 equals W. <coughs> and that's an equation for this. Well, Sort of uh, here's the equation, uh. and now these x's just become z to the p minus ones. And so, so we see how to make a semi-stable reduction. We just have to go extract the p minus first root of, of p. So we essentially a join, a join of p, th you know, p root of unity. And then normalize. So, uh, so that's what you do. So we see that x one p becomes semi-stable after passing to QP adjoins Z to P. And a local equation becomes uh, Z1 times Zn equals uniformizer. But now we can also see the, inertia, the geometric inertial action. Because all the, all the geometric inertial action is on this pi. Yeah, all the inertial action is on this pi. So let me just finish by now just uh, writing sort of one more picture. We have our x1p, we have x naught p. Here, We have the product of n copies of fp star, which are multiplying this z by, by a p minus first root of unity. And uh, so in, inside here, we have fp star in the ith place. And we have the, the mod p cyclotomic character. Let me write chi just to not confuse it with this w. We have the mod p cyclotomic character. And so we see that on a component of the special fiber where <coughs> zi <coughs> equals 0, 
inertia x via psi i, perhaps in this normalization to the minus 1. So, so what is this psi i? That's the character from inertia into this torus, which is physically acting on the variety. And we see that on the component where zi equals 0, the action of inertia is given by a torus valued character. That's a geometric statement, which obviously you can pass through all these hyperplane section arguments. And hence, you can reduce the theorem, at least, that you can reduce the theorem to, in the end, to the naive idea, plus then the rest of the argument, which Toby will explain after lunch. So thank you.